So tonight, we have Stephen Trainoff, PhD. He earned his BS in Physics from Caltech and a PhD in Physics from UCSB. He um, is the Chief Scientist for Wyatt Technology Corporation here in town, uh, which has many times been awarded the top place to work, in, uh, one of the top places to work in the United States. And he designs optical instruments for pharmaceutical and material science research. In his free time, he has been traveling the globe uh, photography, photographing the strange and beautiful creatures that inhabit our underworld, or, uh, one underwater wa uh, world. And he is an amazing photographer. So please welcome Stephen Trainoff. Thank you very much for joining me tonight. Um, it's an honor uh, to see so many people, and uh, especially on such a beautiful evening. I want to tell you about a really fascinating place that I had the privilege to visit, and that's Yap. There was a book written in 1910 by an anthropologist, William Furness, where he described the Yapese culture and this curious tradition they have of these giant stone coins. And you can see my wife, you know, she's uh, going to be the model in many of my photos, <laughs> sitting in front of these big coins. Now, I'm going to lean pretty heavily on Furness because much of what we know about the history of this society comes from him. But I want to start with sort of a baby of controversial topic. It's, these are all money, right? So we've got dollar bills, we have stone coins, we have big gold bars, we have digital currencies like credit cards and Bitcoin and so on. But in some sense, what are they? I mean, what is money? I mean, a dollar bill is just a piece of paper. Gold is just a metal that's dug out of the ground and refined. And, and the, the bottom two, they're even worse. There is digits in a computer somewhere. And yet, somehow, they have value. And so in Yap, it's one of these unique places where giant stone coins have value. OK. Well, Yap is a small town, but it's also an independent country. There's about 11,000 people on Yap. To get it in context, that's about 10% of Santa Barbara. But it has this really interesting and unique culture that goes back thousands of years. So I'm not going to talk so much about the prehistory, but let me just give you a brief outline. The first people who arrived in Yap arrived about 1500 BC, probably from Indonesia and the Philippines. Um, they've been doing genetic studies, um, but they're unique from the Polynesians that inhabited much of like Hawaii and the other Polynesian islands. It had many visitors because it's in trade routes. It's, it's very well situated for cross-Pacific uh, travel. Um, the first discovery was by the Portuguese explorers in the 1500s. And what I mean by discovery is they put it on charts. But uh, a few years after this Portuguese uh, explorer landed, another boat landed, and the Yapis came out and visited them and said, welcome to our island in flawless Spanish. So they were not the first. <laughs> okay, but the, but the Spanish were these great explorers and conquerors, and they annexed the islands in the 1600s, and they held it for a long time. There's sort of an odd history of in the late um, 1800s, Germany in their expansionist phase took over the island and they tried before that to make uh, trade goods. They tried to trade for copra and coconut um, oil and so on. They were very unsuccessful. The Germans um, brought trade goods, but the Yapis had a very good life. They had plenty of food, they had lots of fish in the ocean, they had, you know, clothing on every tree, and they weren't interested in the trade goods. They'd accept them, but they didn't see any reason to go and plant big palm trees and, and coconut trees and try to harvest them for sale. So the Germans were very unsuccessful as traders. But they bought the islands, the Carolina Islands, um, which is this chain in Micronesia, for 3.3 million from the Spanish as they were getting out of their uh, colonial phase. And it, it plays a little bit in my story. There's a long history of the relations with Japan. I'm not going to dwell so much uh, about the Japanese history, but it was occupied during World War II, and uh, the war in the Pacific did come to the islands, and there was fighting. It wasn't a heavy, a heavy uh, fighting area, but there's lots of remnants of the Japanese uh, um, uh, time on the islands. It was liberated at the end of the war, and it became a, the uh, area became a U.S. trust territory administered by the United States. Um, the citizens of Micronesia were not citizens of the United States, so unlike Puerto Rico, where they are US citizens, they were independent. And they were administered by the US, and with a lot of cultural exchange occurred. There was the Peace Corps, there was you know, people coming from Yap to learn and work in the United States. So actually, there's strong cultural ties 
between uh, Micronesia and the United States. As a matter of fact, when it was a US trust territory, the IPs could come and work without a visa in the United States and then go back, and many people did. They would join the military, they would go work in uh, various companies in the United States, and then go back home and take care of their families. So we met any number of people who had, oh yes, I grew up in Oregon, I was spent there for 30 years, and I came home. <laughs> or I was a truck driver in New Jersey. <laughs> okay. But anyways, it has a strong ties with the United States. As a US trust territory, the currency is the US dollar, when they don't use the stone coins. Um, and yeah, so it's a, actually a very friendly place for the United States, and the yeah, peace people are amazingly warm and very um, you know, friendly, so we felt very much at home. But it's like the ultimate small town. I mean, with 11,000 people, everybody knows everything about everybody, and everybody's related to everybody. <laughs> so the, the Federated States of Micronesia became independent in the 1979, and they are an independent country now. And so when we went, um, we had to have our visas, and that's okay. Um, so the Federated States of Micronesia consists of four island states. There's Yap, Chuk, Pompeii, and Kosre. And so we only, excuse me, we only visited Yap. One of the nice things about it is it's really easy to get there. Yeah. <laughs> All you have to do is get on an airplane and fly to San Francisco, and then fly to Honolulu, and then fly to Guam, and then fly to Yap. Easy. And you end up in downtown Yap. And you, hopefully you don't blink because you might miss it. So this is um, Colonia. Uh, it's the economic center, the civic center, and you can walk through it in about five minutes. So this is actually the Supreme Court building. Um, they, they modeled much of their government on the US. So we found the Environmental Protection Agency, we found uh, the, uh, the, you know, the economic board, but they're all in these little tiny sheds. Um, but you know, this is, it has this small town feel, which I found very appealing. The Yapis have done a great deal to try to preserve a lot of their cultural heritage and become a modern city or a modern country at the same time. So in fact, this is not, a, you know, the outer islands are much more rural, but this island is actually fairly modern. Electricity, you know, um, you know good roads, good water, and so on. And now I want to get back to this history of the stone money. So they started, um, the, the earliest, uh, explorers, when they arrived in the 1700s, they found that there was a long history of the stone money. The, the legends say it goes back all the way about a thousand years ago, where one of their navigators um, was, went visited the neighboring island of um, Palau, and they discovered these deposits of this very fine limestone that are sort of sparkly and white, and they just loved it. They tried carving these fish and they were heavy and they couldn't bring them, so eventually they settled on giant round um, discs with a big hole in the middle so they could put um, bamboo and have a large number of men pick them up. Now one of the things to point out is these islands have, uh, they're, they're, they're uh, not volcanic, but they uh, exist at the intersection of two continental plates, the Pacific plate and the Philippine plate, and so they're uplifted out of the ocean and they have these giant fringing reefs. They look like atolls, but they're not. The atolls, uh, they, sorry, the fringing reefs go out maybe several miles of coral, but there's no metals on these islands anywhere. So the culture, everything they made was made of stone or natural fibers or natural materials. So when they wanted to, to quarry these giant coins, how do you do it? Well, they used shell tools and it took them weeks of quarrying, but first they had to get to Palau in order to do it. So they have a very long history of, of navigation they built these ocean-going canoes, and I kept wondering, why did they call them canoes? Well, they're actually, the base of this canoe was a giant dugout, often out of a mahogany tree. They have these large hardwoods. Um, and then they would build up on top of it a series of planks that you, they would uh, seal together with ties made of vegetable fibers, and they'd use wood sap to, to seal them. But they made these large ocean-going kayaks, and they would take a crew of about 17 people, and they would go to Palau and quarry these coins. The problem is, Palau is 300 miles away, and this is the Pacific Ocean, nice and peaceful. Of course, it's the, probably the most misnamed body of water in the world because the Pacific Ocean is anything but Pacific. But these were very seaworthy boats made of big timbers, and they could weather the storms, so they would routinely make these 300-mile trips. And of course, getting to, to, from Yap to uh, Palau is easy as well. You just get on the boat, and you sail. 
and then you quarry for weeks, and you have strong men lift these giant stone coins and put them on rafts, and then carry them across to uh, put them on rafts and pull them across the ocean, and then they would bring them back, and they'd put them in front of their home to display their wealth. So this is a stone money bank in one of the Yapese villages, and the Yapese would show their wealth, because what is the point in having all of this wealth if you can't show people what it is? <laughs> but there's a little problem. How do you spend a stone coin? How do you make change? <laughs> because if you break it up, it's just rubble. So what they would do, it's, it's fascinating, they would went from literally physical currency, giant blocks of, of, of stone, and they switched very quickly to what we would call a virtual currency. Namely, they would transfer the ownership of the coin and leave it where it was. And so these coins, some of which were owned by the villages, and some were owned by other people. And as long as the people in the village had an oral tradition, they knew who owned what. So it's fascinating that very quickly they went to what we would call a virtual currency, from the most physical currency you could imagine. Now, what's to prevent anyone from going to Palau to get more? Well, nothing. They did these trips over and over and over again. So if you look around the island, there are stone coins everywhere. Um, and of course, it's really easy. You just put them on a raft, and the bigger and the more uh, well chipped out they are, the more valuable they are. Except sometimes this happens. <laughs> So I want to give you a quote from Furness because it really illustrates the, the role of stone money in their, in their society. So he writes this, um, this quote. Now, I want to point out there was a, a beautiful article written by Milton Friedman, who was a Nobel Prize winning economist. And in 1991, he compared sort of the Yapese currency and the stone money to the modern banking system. And he found this quote from Furness for me. So he writes, my faithful old friend Fatumak assured me that there was in the village nearby a family whose wealth was unquestioned, acknowledged by everyone, and yet no one, not even the family itself, had ever laid eye or hand on this wealth. It consisted of enormous fay, which is the name of the stone coins, whereof the size is known only by tradition. For the past two or three generations, it had been and still was lying at the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> Many years ago, an ancestor of this tradition, of this family, on an expedition after Fay, secured this remarkably large and exceedingly valuable stone coin, which was placed on a raft to be towed homeward. A storm arose, and the party, to save its lives, were obliged to cut the raft adrift, and the stone sank out of sight. When they reached home, they testified that the Fay was of magnificent proportions and extraordinary quality, and that it was lost through no fault of the owner. Thereupon, it was universally conceded in their simple faith that the mere accident of its loss overboard was too trifling to mention and that a few hundred feet of water offshore ought not to affect its marketable value. <laughs> Since it was chipped out in proper form, the purchasing power of the stone thereby was as valid as if it was leaning by the side of the owner's house. So literally a virtual currency, you don't even have to see it to know that it's there. So while we're underwater, let me just show you around because one of the things I really love to do is to visit pristine and beautiful reefs and Yap was just stunning in the preservation. So this is an example of some of the reefs you'll find. The man in the background is uh, Bill Acker, who's probably the reason we were there because he came to Yap in the 70s as part of the Peace Corps and I met a few other people who would visit Yap as part of the Peace Corps. And he fell in love with the island, he fell in love with the Yapese woman, he married her and he stayed. And so he was this Texas boy in the middle of Yap, and he had to make a living. And he loved to dive, so he put together this dive operation, and he figured out the logistics of how to, to bring people to show them the beautiful uh, marine life and the reefs of this place. And so he single-handedly grew their tourism industry. And so everyone on the island knows him, and he is probably one of the most respected men on the island for that reason. But it is a stunning place. It's, has pristine corals all the way around. Then I should point out there's really two types. There's the diving and the marine area inside the reef, which is very calm, and it goes from maybe this, the surface, of course, down to about 50 feet. And then outside the reef, there, it's pelagic, and so you get big ocean uh, pelagic creatures. The centerpiece of uh, the operation he put together, he called the Manta Ray Bay Inn, because in the bay, these giant Pacific manta rays will come in, and they're not feeding, they would hover over the coral as a cleaning station, and these little fish would come up and clean them. And so they're very reliably there. You might have to wait a while. So we would go out and sit on the bottom outside. This, this reef would go for about uh, you know, 100 yards. But on the edge, there's a sandy bottom, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait. 
And then in come these magnificent creatures. In many places that you visit around the world where there's a lot of boat traffic or fishing, you find the corals are broken, or even places where they preserve the, the uh, natural world, sometimes the, the very people who visit are the source of the damage. But Yap was just beautiful. There were no broken corals anywhere. There were no scars from, from boat anchors. It was just like something out of a storybook. And so you find these just beautiful corals. And of course, whenever you have corals, they're the base of the food chain. They allow the little fish to, to grow and hide away from predators. And so you find big, beautiful sea turtles. And I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm wearing a shirt with spotted eagle rays, and there are beautiful spotted eagle rays. And the eagle rays are really interesting. They, you notice they have this shovel nose mouth where they'll go down and they eat little crustaceans and worms in the sand. And they'll go down, they'll root around in the sand. And so you really see the shovel there. And outside the reef, they have sharks. And sharks are the sign of a healthy reef because they are the ones that keep everything in balance. But like I said, the star of the show, at least for many of these uh, areas, uh, dives were the corals. So this is a plate coral. To me, it reminds me of a ponderosa pine out in the, you know, the great west. But much as I like spending time underwater, every once in a while you get back and back in, you have to dry out and head back in the land. So let's do that. Um, Yap consists of four islands that are very close together and a big fringing reef around it. And the Germans, during their occupation, um, tried to improve the island. So one of the things they did is, even though the natural reef has multiple breaks and a natural deep water harbor, which is very uh, good for trading because there's ways to get in, lar even large boats, but the Germans added these extra canals. So this is a German dug canal, where I should say a Yapese dug canal with the Germans uh, directing them. One of the things that they tried to do is they tried to improve the road network on the island. So historically, the Yapese life is centered around villages. And each village had maybe 100 people, and there were roughly 100 villages. And then there were these coral paths or sand paths between the islands. But again, they had no um, vehicles. There were no carts. There was nothing. So the Germans decided, well, if we're going to bring like wood out of the forest and, and access this, we're going to need cart paths. And they tried to convince the Yapese to build them. And they did actually hit upon one way of getting through this idea that the Yapese had this beautiful life, and they didn't see any reason to work for the Germans. But one functionary found the key. So well, here's another great Furness quote. He says, there are no wheeled vehicles on Yap, and consequently no cart roads. But there are always have been clearly delineated paths communicating the different settlements. When the German government assumed ownership of the Caroline Islands after the purchase of them from Spain in 1898, Many of these paths or highways were in very bad condition. And the chiefs of several districts were told they must repair their uh, paths and put them in good order. Now, a lot of people don't like to be told. So the roughly dressed blocks of coral were quite fine for bare feet of the natives. And after many repetitions of the command, which were still remained unheeded, at last it was decided to impose a fine for disobedience on the chiefs. And what shape should the fine be levied? Last, a happy thought, one of the uh, German um, governors said, decided the fine was to be exacted by sending a man to every Philu, every Pabai, throughout the disobedient districts, where he simply marked a certain number of the most valuable fay with a cross in black paint to show that these stones were claimed by the government. <laughs> this instantly worked like a charm. The people, thus dolefully impoverished, turned to and repaired the highways to such good effect from one end of the island to the other that they're now like park drives. The government then dispatches agents and erased the crosses. Presto, the fine was paid, the happy Filus resumed their possession of their capital stock and rolled in their wealth. <laughs> now this say it sounds a little bit crazy, you know, how is it that putting a big X on it suddenly transfers ownership? <laughs> well, this is where Milton Friedman had a really interesting story. He said, this does sound crazy, but is it really that crazy? And he cites this example that in 1931, when the, the US was still on the gold standard, the Bank of France had a large amount of uh, uh, currency in US dollars. And the US was talking about going off the gold standard, and they were thinking they weren't going to be able to get as much gold later. So they decided to convert all of their US currency into gold. So they wrote to the Federal Reserve Bank and said, OK, convert all of our US dollars into gold. But rather than putting out the gold bars on boats and trying to ship it back to France, they asked them to leave it in the bank. 
So what the, bank, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank did is it took all of France's gold out of one vault, they put it in another vault, and they put a big label on the door saying, owned by France. <laughs> and how is this any different than putting a big cross on your stone and saying, owned by the German government? It's not. So remember, money is really a mental concept. We think of it as something physical, but it's really a state of mind. So during the German occupation era, where they were largely unsuccessful at trying to convince the Yapese to trade with them, there was an interesting interlude with an American trader. So there was this fellow by the name of David O'Keefe, who was captaining a ship that was trying to visit this, uh, the Pacific Islands in, to uh, trade for pearls. Well, he wrecked his ship on the reef, and it was rescued by the Yapese. And this was in the late 1700s, uh, sorry, sorry, 1874. And he was re wrecked on the island, and the only people on the island were the Yapese who'd rescued him, and one lone German trader who was trying very unsuccessfully to trade with him. But he learned the culture, and he learned really what made, uh, what they considered valuable, and what they considered um, important. So he actually cracked the code of how to trade with the Yapese. What he did is after he left the island, he went to Hong Kong and he had a business partner, a Chinese business partner. And what he did is he got a, a sailing boat, a Chinese a junk, and he brought modern tools, stone, uh, sorry, metal tools. He brought it back to Yap and he got a large number of Yapese men and he sailed them to Palau in his big ship. And he showed them that with stone tools, you could quarry really big stone coins. <laughs> and you had a boat that was big enough to bring them back. So they were over the moon, and they quarried these enormous coins, and they got bigger and bigger. I've got it up to 12 feet across, and he put them in the hold of his ship, and he sailed them back to Yap. But he didn't just give it to them, even though it was the Yapese who did the quarrying and did all of it. He sold them to them. So what he discovered is in Hong Kong, they had um, a tremendous desire for sea cucumbers. It's a delicacy in Chinese food, Chinese uh, cuisine. So he convinced the Yapese to dive in the lagoon, which was just covered with sea cucumbers, and they would bring these sea cucumbers up, they would also uh, get the coconut, um, you know, the coconut oil and the copra from the coconut trees, and he would trade the stone coins that were quarried to them. And so he then went back to uh, Hong Kong and sold his sea cucumbers, and he did this triangle trade for many years. And he became fabulously wealthy. He became a millionaire, he bought, well, he, acquired one of the islands uh, in the lagoon, and he set himself up with his own flag and his own sovereign nation. And there's a beautiful book called His Majesty O'Keefe that describes the life and times of this uh, colorful character. There's an old Burt Lancaster, I think it's a Burt Lancaster film by the same title, which I've been told is terrible and you should avoid, but the book is actually quite good. <laughs> now, the Yapese people, um, have worked hard to try to preserve their cultural tradition. And for many years, the, the villages had this caste system where they would you know, fight for dominance over the other villages. And often these fights turned violent, but over the time, they sort of subjugated this violent tendency into instead of actually fighting, they would have ritual fighting in the form of dance. Now, I think of this as sort of like how we have football. It's sort of ritual fighting in the form of sport and it prevents people from really fighting, although sometimes sports fans can fight. <laughs> so the Yapi's version of football is the traditional dance. And these dances, each one is unique to a village, and they go back, you know, literally centuries. And they still train the children on these dances, and each village is very proud that they have their own unique uh, form of dance. And they have a festival every May 1st called Yap Days, where they have competition. Now, one side effect of the O'Keefe prosperity is what we would call inflation. <laughs> All of a sudden, he flooded the market with stone coins. And bigger and better and more perfect than any of the historical ones. So that, in most cultures, that would be a problem. But in fact, they realized these new coins, yeah, they might be beautiful, they might be flashy, but they're not as valuable because the stories behind them are not as valuable. When you spent three weeks chipping out a, a coin with shell tools and braving the sea in a, in, a, in a canoe, that's more worthwhile than one that's basically easily obtained. So the large coins, it turns out, are less valuable now than the smaller ones. And you can really tell the large coins from the small ones or the, the 
the ones from the O'Keefe era, from the, small, from the historical ones, because the lines are sharp. When you did shell tools, all of the lines are rounded. And, with the, and also, with the big coins, they would turn them, and so they were perfect, but they were less valuable. Now, during the, the time where the Japanese had occupied the island and when there was fighting, as happens whenever you have war, is you have war wrecks. So in the middle of the jungle, you'll find things like this. This is a Japanese Zero that crashed in the forest. And again, it's a very small community. There's only about 11,000 people. Like I said, about 10% of the size of Santa Barbara. And the people, local farmers, would do their best to try to preserve some of these. And they'd reassemble some of the artifacts. And so here's that Zero. And I, I was looking at this, and I noticed there's something that just seems a little bit weird. What's this thing over here? That's the landing gear. The wings upside down. <laughs> okay, so that's enough time above water. Let, let's hit the water again, zip through one of those ch uh, German channels and see the ocean. So one of the nice things about going uh, with Bill Acker is um, Bill uh, was actually spent the time we were there uh, with my, uh, as my, as our dive guide, basically helping look after my wife. So she and I spent the boat on uh, the day on the boat with him every day. We got the hill hear many of his Texas tall tales. Some of them are actually true. But one of the things about having a local is he knows every rock, every crevice, where all the beautiful things are. Like here is this ice blue anemone. I've never seen anything like it. He says, oh, I gotta show this to you. And he swims under and he, he points it. Or he'll find a little crevice and he'll, he'll open it up and there'll be a lizard fish or something in there. It's really nice to, to go with a naturalist that knows the area, loves the area, and helps preserve it. And like I said, he knew every rock, like his backyard. And of course, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be uh, complete without an emo, so an empty fish. So, got a little late, and out in the dark. This is in the pelagic, outside of the reef. You get these pelagic things that drift in from the deep. So there's a little jellyfish that I, you know, the, the, the dive guides are looking at me, he's like, Where's he going? <laughs> and I see this thing off in the distance. I didn't go very far, but it's a beautiful little jellyfish. And then it's getting late, so we had to head back. But one of the nice things is inside the lagoon, it's very calm, and the water is placid, and it's shallow, and there's no current, and there's no waves. So it's a perfect place to go spotting very small fish that otherwise are very difficult to spot. So one of my favorite animals on the island are these guys. So this is a mandarin fish, or a mandarin dragonette. And he's about this big, about two inches. And he lives in this coral, and all day they just stay in the coral, you'll never find them during the day. But at night, or at dusk, they come out and try to find a mate. So this is a male with his little mating display, and there's a little female down here in the corner. And they come out, and they do their little dance, where the male chases the female around. And eventually this will go on for about 10 or 15 minutes, and I could sit there and stare at the coral for like 20 minutes and not see anything. And then the local guide would swim up and he'd say, oh, it's right there. <laughs> and then I'd spot him and I'd try to, don't, don't lose him, don't lose him. Okay, he's gone. <laughs> so each one of these dives, I spent 70 minutes underwater. I did this every night for five nights. And so after six hours, I managed to get the happy couple. Now they're so skittish. They almost never look at you. They almost never look at each other. But what they do, with the, is once they found each other, they've done their little dance, they go and they mate, and they disappear, and then they're done with the evening. And then I can go back and have dinner. <laughs> Except somebody else can have dinner. So these are little pajama uh, cardinal fish. And they're also only about two inches. And they might not look like it, but they're voracious predators. So they sit there and they wait till the mandarin fish do their little deed, and then they eat all the eggs. Oh. But not all of them, because there were plenty of mandarin fish. Okay, but then I would go back and, no, I wasn't going to have an omelet, but I was thinking of it. <laughs> the other thing I like to do when visiting an island is, of course, it's a beautiful place. The natural history is spectacular. The cultural aspects are really interesting. But I like to meet the people. So we visited this island, uh, this one village, and there were these little kids that were looking at us a little curiously. And one of the things I like to do is I bring little squares of origami paper with me because Paper doesn't cost anything, just a penny. I fold it into a little figure, and then it's a great icebreaker. So I gave the little girl a little, uh, little helicopter that you can throw, and it spins. And then I gave the little boy a little uh, silver frog, and they became my best friends. <laughs> and I said, OK, I 
got this big camera, you want to take my picture? And the little boy said, the little girl said, <laughs> so they took my photo. <laughs> that's, other than the mandarin fish, that's probably my favorite photo from the trip. <laughs> but you know, these little kids, they remind me of these little kids. Now, I don't know, I think the first set are cuter, but I like these two. Now, outside of the reef, like I said, they're very healthy, so you get big schools of fish. Here's some Pacific barracuda. Now, what people think, I don't know why they think barracuda is dangerous, but these little barracuda are this big, and they're just very cute, and they have these beady black eyes, and they swarm around in the, swarm around in the current. But like I said, there's healthy shark populations. I really like this one because the big shark here is pregnant, which means the sign of a healthy ecosystem. That's always a, a great thing to see. Now, Yap has done a really good job of protecting the sharks. It's illegal to fish sharks in Yapese waters because, you know, Asia is just a four hour flight away. So if they didn't do it, all the sharks would be gone in a heartbeat. But they've done a very good job of protecting it. They have a small fishing industry, but it's mostly for you know, local consumption. But that means the reefs are filled with beautiful fish. And uh, it's really a special place. Now, as I mentioned, they have this very ancient cultural history and they're working hard to try to preserve it, but they're also moving in the modern world. So on our flight out there, we noticed this one guy was getting the royal treatment. He said, hi, Ed, how you doing, Ed? And everyone on the airplane seemed to know him. It turns out he was the president of Micronesia. <laughs> and he was there because the World Bank had funded a project in Yap to build a wind farm. So I climbed up the hill on our last day when I couldn't do any more diving. And they, the wind farm consisted of three turbines, but they're quite large. They're 375 kilowatts. So historically, they would bring in tankers and burn diesel fuel and generators, and it's not a very environmental way. But they, this is a culture of navigators, people who've harnessed the wind for generations. So I think it's appropriate that they harness the wind now. So while I was you know, preparing for this talk, and I'd noticed there's this odd similarity between stone coins and modern virtual currencies or cryptocurrencies. I ran across a paper in an econ economics journal that's just three weeks old where they went through exactly why stone coins are like Bitcoin. <laughs> so I thought I'd just spend a little bit talking about it. So they're similar. I mean, you think about it. They're both valuable because they're difficult to obtain. So the Yap coins, you had to go to Palau. You had to take a three-week, you know, a three-day voyage over, you know, 300 miles with oceans, you know, swells, and mine these things with, with uh, shell tools. Bitcoin, you mine them with computers, but it takes a tremendous amount of you know, t computation and processing, so there are not very many of them. They're hard to get. The ownership is, tra is transferred through what's called a public ledger. So for the stone coins, it's everyone in the village. If you know Joe owns this coin, Joe owns it. The public ledger for Bitcoin is there's a lot of computers, and as long as the transaction is recorded in more than 50% of them, the transaction has occurred. And they're largely immune to theft. One, because they're big and they're really hard to move. And besides, if you picked up a stone coin and you put it in another village, nobody's going to be fooled. <laughs> they're going to know which coin it was. And the Bitcoin are, are different because they're secured by cryptography. Now, they're a little different. Bitcoin can be, can be subdivided, whereas if you break a, a, a rye, you have rubble. You have nothing, no value. Um, they're interchangeable, Bitcoin are interchangeable, the coins are not. These are all unique, and like I said, the ones that have the best stories are the most valuable. And the last thing, of course, is Bitcoin are anonymous and the stone coins are anything but. I wanted to sort of finish my talk by pointing out that this area has a large number of cultures, and they're very different. So we were talking about to the uh, peace people, and they said, oh, the people in Chuck, their cultures, we don't even recognize them. But it's even worse than that. So here's our boat crew. So this man here was our captain. He was from Yap, and he spoke Yapese. And our dive master, who would be underwater keeping track of us and looking, uh, looking after our, our well-being, was from Satawan, one of the outer islands, that has only about 1,000 people, and they have their own language. And he speaks Satawanese, and the only way they can communicate is through English. <laughs> so, um, now, of course, as you come into the modern world, you end up with modern problems. So I saw this poster on the side of one of the buildings and I thought it was worth going through. It talks about the benefits of the traditional lifestyle. It's called Our Old Yapese way of, Ways of Life. Activities we do, the foods that we eat keep us healthy. Where are you on this diabetes cliff picture? And they talk about healthy things like dancing and tarot patching and eating you know, good foods. 
And then they talk about the modern perils in the second panel here, and they include evils like canned meat and turkey tail and cookies and watching movies and so on. And then they say if you don't, you know, you can get sick and you get diabetes, you might have to go off island. But I think this lesson is actually worth all of us heeding. So whether or not they make this transition to a modern, well, they are a modern society, but how they navigate the modern society while still preserving this rich cultural heritage is probably down to her. And if you look at her expression, I think they're in pretty good hands. Thank you very much. So I'm certain we have some time for questions. I think I have to put my glasses on. I see one here in the front. Uh, yes. So the question is, is there a Yapese language that's still spoken? And yes, it's very much a living language. And I met a, a couple here who lived on Yap for a number of years and had learned some of it. But you know, th this is actually part of the modern world, is as we become more interconnected, a lot of traditional languages go by the wayside. So Yap has 11,000 people, and most of them still pe speak Yapese. But some of these outer islands, with only 1,000 people, those languages could disappear. But yeah, it's definitely a living language. Um, so the question is, was the, uh, was the water brackish and what type of diving did we do? So inside the lagoon, the water is um, trapped at slack tide and it warms up, but there's many breaks in the coral reef. So when the tides change, that water exchanges. As a matter of fact, you would see this sort of dark, uh, turbid water. I don't know if you noticed in the picture I showed of the, uh, the um, uh, whatever, the, the uh, Whatever, some of the fish. <laughs> Barracuda, thank you. That was, uh, it was turbid water behind them because that was water was coming out of the lagoon. Outside, it's pristine, it's blue, you get these deep ocean currents that bring fresh, clear water. So we didn't dive very deep. Most of the beautiful life is within the, you know, 100 feet and, above, uh, and shallower. We did dive nitrox because we spent a lot of time in the water and it's a little safer. So y yes, all of the Yapese speak English, primarily because when it was a US trust territory, English became the language taught in schools. And so it's also the language of commerce. So everyone speaks flawless English. And like I said, the Yapese currency is the US dollar. It's very uh, US friendly. It's a beautiful place to visit. And I recommend doing it. Now, I, when I was researching this talk, I looked at the Yapese tourism board. They get about 4,000 visitors per year. And that's a lot for an island of 11,000 people. But it's not a lot of people. So very, very few people have actually been there. Yeah. Is Ponape so near Yap? So Ponape is Ponape. one, sorry, what? Ponape, Ponape. Ponape yeah. yeah. So it's one of the, micro, uh, the, uh, the islands in the Federated States of Micronesia. I, if I, remember, I was not there, but if I remember my geography, it's about a, a thousand miles away. Oh, okay. So it's accessible by a boat, um, but most people fly. Uh, if you go there. So the question was, are there transactions that still occur with the stone money? And the answer is yes. So they're more ceremonial now. And so people always ask, what's the exchange rate? How many dollars per Yapese coin? <laughs> so they're used for marriages. They're used to write. Let's say there's an infraction between one village member and another. So there would be a fine. And so yeah, a, a traditional coin would be transacted to settle a, a debt that way. It, they are cultural icons. It is not legal to take them off the island. There is uh, a few in the Smithsonian that were taken out before the, this injunction against trading in cultural artifacts. But they're only on Yap now primarily. And they're, like I just said, every few years or every several years they find one interdicted in the airport in Guam. And I'm glad they find it because you, know, you shouldn't be pillaging a cultural her heritage. But yes, they're still used as currency. Sorry, one more. Yeah, so the question is, is the population stable? So again, they're making the transition to a modern life, but if you think about it, let's say you're a young Yapese student, and you go to high school on this island, and you want to become an engineer, or a scientist, or there's no colleges. So you can go to college in Palau, or you can come to the United States. 
And so many people came to the United States, often on uh, scholarships that were provided by um, religious institutions. So there's a strong missionary presence that still provides money. So we met many people who had gone to college or were going to college in the United States. But a lot of them, meet, what that means is a lot of them leave because the, the career prospects in a small island, unless you're going to live a traditional life, are not you know, what we would consider careers. Um, so they're seeing an attrition. And it's, you know, it's, this is a problem with all traditional areas, especially, sm it's, it happens in the United States, in small towns, and when the economy uh, opportunities are in big cities, people leave. So it's not unique. Has the coral affected by climate change? So the question was, it, was the coral affected by climate change? I'd like to say no, but the year before, with it, when we were there, they were saying the previous year they had their very first coral bleaching event. And it was small and the corals were resilient, so they recovered, but they're very concerned because one, okay, so the, let's talk about the economy of this island. Their biggest you know, economic asset is tourism, bringing people to see this amazing place. Their second biggest is uh, betel nut. So they have groves where they grow this uh, betel nut, which is this uh, nut that they chew. It's a mild um, hallucinogenic, or I don't know how you say it, but it's, it's, it gives people a buzz. Um, but it's very popular, and apparently they have very good betel nut, and they sell it all over Asia. Now, when I, sorry, before we went, I was reading about it, and so the traditional way is you wrap it in a spicy um, pepper leaf, and you put lime on it, and then you put it in your cheek, and you chew it. I thought, lime? The fruit? No. It's lime is what you make concrete out of. Oh. <laughs> so they would make the lime by taking coral and baking it in an oven, and basically it's calcium carbonate, and it turns into quick lime. And so that actually, I don't want to get into the chemistry, but that activates or releases the uh, alkaloids that are in the betel nut and make it, make it uh, effective. But yeah, so they actually, people have this red goo coming out of their mouth from chewing the betel nut. It's not very appealing, but also part of their culture. So the question was, how did they get a modern life? And like I said, uh, modern life without the wind farm. So, was U.S. trust territory, so very much strong U.S. influences. So they built roads essentially to U.S. standards. They had water systems built by U.S. engineers. So it was all diesel. So they would bring in tankers and they would you know, load diesel in. But that's a huge economic drain for a, co a country that has very little income. So you can generate electricity for free and you can provide these resources for free by the, by the wind power. So I think that's a major step forward. It makes a great deal of sense. I can make a great deal of sense everywhere in the world. Wind and solar are cheaper now than, than diesel and uh, coal in many parts, most of the world. So in particularly an area where you have strong seasonal winds that just blow for months at a time. So the question, there's two, two parts. One is whether or not the, the coral bleaching was entirely due to warming because global, uh, global climate change also includes carbon dioxide going into the ocean that changes the ocean chemistry and it actually makes it more acidic and acidic uh, conditions make it difficult for corals to grow shells. This was mostly heat because they know the water got warm and the corals, uh, they expel their algae and then they bleach. And if the water cools, the algae comes back and they recover. And the second was, um, how has Western culture changed their society? And you know, because there's the ills of a Western life, is sedentary lifestyle, playing video games. We didn't see a lot of cell phones, so, um, but yes, it's true, people see, consume a lot of Western media. Bill Acker had a really interesting comment. So the traditional Yappies dress is the women would uh, not be covered up, uh, and the, the missionaries tried for centuries to get them to cover up, and they were unsuccessful. And about 20 years ago it changed, and it changed because of the internet and because of Hollywood. So now they consume Western media, they, they wear Western clothing, and so it's a challenge, you know, it's a small society and there's these strong pressures to migrate out to other societies. And so like I said, it's, you know, they have a challenge in front of them. I, I think they're doing a remarkably good job. I didn't see a lot of unhealthy people, but clearly when you have signs on the side of the building about how to prevent diabetes, that's a problem. And so yeah, it's, it's a challenge to make, get the benefits of Western culture without the downsides. So we have one way in the back. Excuse me? Yeah, so um, I had a photo at the very beginning, the picture of my wife. So the traditional village structure is there was a men's lodge 
which was large and grandiose. And then there was the women's homes where they would raise children. And then there was sort of joint you know, areas where families would have family relations. Um, they're built out of uh, bamboo with thatched roofs, um, typically raised so when there's rain, the water would flow out. Um, yeah, so I, at the very beginning, actually, I will uh, see if I can go back. This is uh, an example of one of the traditional men's homes. And next to it is the family home. Now, this was in an area where they have reconstructed it as, I mean, there was a, a village here, but they've reconstructed it in the style of when it was, um, uh, when this was the traditional lifestyle. Of course, the lifestyles are changing. Most people still live in villages, and the village is the, the extended family unit. And there are, like, I think 110 villages, and everyone belongs to a village. Now, of course, that's changing a little bit. So not everyone lives in the village houses. But that's the traditional uh, construction. And it looks very much like an upside down ship. Yeah. OK, so the question is, what was the water temperature? And why was the plow the source of this uh, limestone? So the water temperatures were in the low 80s, so it was very pleasant. It's very much like the Channel Islands right now. Yeah. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no, so it was very pleasant. I, you know, I, I do spend a lot of time in the islands, and I love diving out here. But it is nice every once in a while to go someplace warm and uh, clear. And the question is, why is this one limestone only on Palau and not on Yap? Or whether or not they could get it from further afield? I'm certain, you know, with modern you know, transport, you could quarry stones anywhere in the world. But these were traditional. These were within the realm of their navigation. And they were natural navigators. They didn't have compasses. They read the stars. They read the winds. They read the wave patterns. And they would go hundreds of miles. It was a three-day journey. And they would hit their mark. And of course, if they didn't hit your mark, you would never hear from them again. <laughs> so there was someone in the back that I missed. Yes? Oh, the weather. So it is remarkably temperate. So it's six degrees above the equator. It never got really hot. I think Bill said the hottest it ever gets is in the upper 80s or low 90s. And it never gets very cold. It never gets below about 75. So it's, you know, you can see why when the Germans came and tried to trade with them, the IP said, we've got a good life. We don't see any reason to work harder. Humidity. Excuse me? Humidity. It is humid, which is yeah. why you have to go in the water. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Stephen, we have a little gift for you on behalf of the Maritime Museum. Thank you very much. Thank you. I also want to thank Peter Horworth, who does a column in the news press every Sunday. Wonderful article. If you didn't see it last Sunday, uh, always covers the ocean, does great things. Thank you, everybody, for being a part of our evening tonight. If you're not a member, please grab information about upcoming events on your way out. Please get home safely. Thank you, everybody.